I'm Christine. Welcome to Book Talk. Today we are discussing John Green's new book, Turtles All the Way Down. I read it over the past three days. It was great. John's last book was, maybe you remember it, The Fault in Our Stars. And the day this came out, I was so excited. I went to read the first chapter and I immediately felt like I couldn't read it because I started to feel, I don't want to say the word triggered. Is that the right word? It like triggered my hypochondriacness. In the first chapter, we're talking a lot about cancer. And I was just like, I can't, I can't read it. It's gonna like make me crazy. And I'm gonna, I like, I'm gonna end up fainting reading the book. And then a year and a half later, I picked it up again because I was like super prepared. And then like literally the next chapter, it's fine. Like literally the next chapter, it's fine. So for Turtles All the Way Down, I was like, this is gonna be a complete change of pace. It's gonna be fine. And I read the first chapter and I was like, no, no. No, oh my God, am I not gonna be able to read this? And I was so scared, like I had to put it down because it was so real for me reading Aza's thought process. So much of this book, like I, I, I've had thoughts just like this. Like sometimes I'd have to take a break because I don't want to, like it's everything I try not to think about. I found Aza's mental state to be like a much more intense version of what I deal with. There were so many moments where I was reading this and I just was like shook. All you really need to know going in is that Aza is a teenage girl. She's a junior in high school who's struggling with OCD. There's this billionaire Davis and his dad is kind of a criminal and he's gone kind of missing. And her and her best friend take it upon themselves to try to solve this mystery. Like all John Green books, you can hear John in it. I couldn't not hear him just saying everything. <laughs> I feel like I've, see, I've heard him say these exact thoughts in his videos. So I know this is like a very personal book for him and it just makes everything even more real. In the beginning, it was like hard for me to imagine Aza as a girl because John's voice was so strong in it. And then as we went on, as the book developed and we saw more of Aza as a character, I started to find her voice um, and hear her when I read her words. I really enjoyed this book. I got emotional a lot. I ended in tears on the plane because <laughs> I was reading it on the plane. Of course I was. This is getting so old. You're seeing you read everything that makes you cry on a plane. I'm trying to decide where it falls on the John Green book scale for me. I used to think Paper Towns was my favorite John Green book, but like the more I think about it, I'm like, was The Fault in Our Stars my favorite John Green book? I think it's just been too long since I read Paper Towns. I still think Paper Towns was my favorite John Green book. And I can't decide if Turtles is now my favorite John Green book or if Fault is or if Paper Towns is. I'm trying to think which one made me the happiest because that's how I usually like favorite books. And Fault was like, I laughed and cried back and forth and it didn't have the emotional punch for me because I was spoiled because I read it a year and a half after it came out. Paper Towns, I didn't like how it ended. I remember being like, that's it? And then Turtles, I, I liked the whole thing. Um, there were moments where I laughed, but it wasn't like in Falls in Our Stars where I was like, ha, 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 ha. it was like, ha, this is real. Or it was like, I have to put this down because I'm, I'm, I'm losing it a little bit. Turtles All the Way Down gets an A from me. I think that's all I'm gonna say in this non-spoilery section. Go pick it up, read it, then come back and we can discuss it together. I'm gonna spoil things now. So goodbye people who haven't read the book yet. Goodbye. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Okay, dokie. Turtles all the way down. I'll begin where I ended, thinking about how this could be turned into a film. This isn't really a filmy book. It's very internal. We're inside Aza's head all the time. And that's really where the struggle is. And to make it into a film, some creative shit would have to happen. And it could be really interesting and different, but it would not be your typical like YA contemporary adaptation. The first chapter is where I think we get the most intense look inside Aza's head because we're thrown right in there. Immediately, I was thrown into my head just like reading in her head. I had to skim all the parts where she started talking about C. diff. I like, I don't even know what it is because I like was just like, oh, the disease, skip. I can't, I can't like focus in on that stuff because I'm gonna start focusing in on it. I don't even know how to explain my feelings here. I, I just, I felt for her and I hated those parts where she like couldn't control where her thoughts were going and hearing her turn all those feelings into these very beautiful, very sad metaphors just hit me over and over and over again. Let's talk about Daisy. I really enjoyed Daisy's character. The one thing that 
kept frustrating me is like how everyone around Aza always insisted on watching space movies after she specifically was like, I don't really like space movies. There's a thousand other movies, yet they always watch Star Wars and she just like thinks Star Wars is okay. In Daisy's head, she's probably like, well, the world revolves around Aza, so it's fine if we watch a movie that I like every time we watch a movie, you know? But then like, even with Davis, she, she says that she doesn't like space operas and then he puts on Jupiter Ascending, which she does like, but I don't, it's just space movie after space movie. And I'm just like, give her a freaking break. She doesn't like space movies. And maybe I'm projecting because I am not a big space movie fan. I've tried, I tried real hard. Okay, I watched all the Star Wars movies and I do like the new Star Wars movies, but I'm still not like a huge fan. I liked Rogue One, but I didn't love it. It was like a lot of space stuff and not a lot of character stuff. I need that character stuff. I know there are characters and they're great, but like, they're not as intense in the old Star Wars movies. It's more about like the world and that world is in space. Okay, I'm gonna stop talking about space movies. But, like, I feel you on the space movie stuff. I love that Daisy writes Chewbacca Ray fan fiction. I love the way that ended up being integrated into the plot. Her stories clearly reflect things that are going on in her life. And when Aza starts to read them and see the character that's her, I mean, it hurts so much to watch that. It hurts so much every time Daisy makes a comment like that. I understand what she's saying, but at the same time, it hurts to hear it over and over and over and over and and read it. She's been writing that character for years. <sighs> Those paragraphs at the end that were like told from future Aza really got me. It's getting me right now thinking about it because I just read it a couple of hours ago when she was talking about how she and Daisy are still friends now and the longer they were friends the deeper their friendship grew and all that stuff about having a family. I just, it was just, <laughs> It was, it was good. As usual, when I take notes on my iPad, I highlight passages that I particularly enjoy. I really love when they first went to Davis's house and like immediately David's like, well, I wish you hadn't come for the reward. Oh, it hurts. But I love how straightforward they all are. They all are really straightforward, except for Aza, because a lot of the time she's like stuck in her head, but she still is really honest about what's going on inside her head. Like, I don't think I'd have the guts to tell a boy in high school that I liked, that I was kind of dating, that I couldn't kiss him. So many of us are so insecure at that age. I'd be so afraid that that was spread around the school and everyone would be talking about it. And I know that Davis doesn't even go to their school and he would never tell anybody. But still saying those words aloud? I just read this quote that I really liked. Holmesley, you're a glow, you're luminous, you're beaming. I'm not. You are. I honestly can't even tell if he's cute. He's in that vast boy middle. Like good looking enough that I'm willing to be won over. The whole problem with boys is that 99% of them are like, okay, if you could dress and hygiene them properly and make them stand up straight and listen to you and not be dumbasses, they'd be totally acceptable. <laughs> The kissing thing was repeatedly leaving me shook. The first time when she started kissing him and then started freaking out, that felt like super real and close to home. Aza goes into this microbacterial thought spiral, which is like you have to do lots of research to learn about. I have this strict ban on from myself from researching anything related to that shit because I know that I can't my mind will just go crazy and I can't, I don't want that. I don't let myself do it. When I do let myself do it, cause like sometimes I just, I can't stop myself from Googling stupid disease shit when I have like some random ache or pain. I either go one way or the other, like total crazy town. Like somehow I invent that this is happening to me or like it's come completely wrong with what I thought might be happening. Cause like there's immediate like big symptom that I don't have, which is nice. But most of the time it's the other way. The internet has so much that you don't want to look at. Just don't look at anything ever. That's my, that's my motto. <laughs> don't look at anything ever related to health. Like that was my biggest worry starting this book. I just immediately, when I was reading it, I was like, am I going to turn into this now? Cause I'm reading it. And this is what I do. Like it, it just, someone has something in some foreign land and then like, if I, if I look at it more and think about it more, it's just like, I'm going to, it's gonna happen. I don't even want to talk, I'm sweating talking about this. I can't talk about my thought spirals. So the first time I was like, yeah, hashtag relatable. The second time she freaks out and she runs to the bathroom and she's thinking about like the hand sanitizer. I was like, no, no, mouthwash. But when she like takes the Purell and swallows it, I had to put down the book for a second. It just it hit, it hurt my heart. I just, I needed her to tell someone and she never told anybody. And I, that was like the biggest shock to me in the entire book, the hand sanitizer happening. And it scared the shit out of me. But that's the kind of thing that would send me into a spiral of like, I'm gonna die. I just swallowed hand sanitizer and I'm going down. I was really afraid she was gonna like, I don't know, kill herself by hand sanitizer. 
I don't I don't know. I was really I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Let's stop talking about this. I love how the parts where Asa was stalking Davis online. Like, it was so natural. You don't even bat an eye at it. It's like, yeah, this is what we do. And I haven't seen that really in a book before like this. She reads this quote off of Davis's blog. He who doesn't fear death dies only once. And I stopped right there and I was like, that is so real. It takes me straight back to Kaz. Wrecker in the Six of Crows trilogy. If you read it, you know what I'm talking about. And then like a second later, she's like, for the record, he who does fear death only dies once too. But I'm over here like, no, Aza, I don't need just that. This is metaphorically on point. She also reads this blog post where he goes, I think this is goodbye, my friends. Although then again, no one ever says goodbye unless they want to see you again. And what a great sentence. When we wrapped around the end and that was the sentence that we ended on, I was already crying, but like I was more crying. Authors like John Green, they write these perfect sentences and then you're sitting here working on your own book and all of a sudden you feel like all your sentences are like wannabe sentences. Like this is a real sentence. And like my sentences are just like baby sentences playing dress up. Okay, can we talk about this scene where Davis is just like, I don't want to think about you being here for the reward anymore. I like can't trust you. So let me just pay you a hundred thousand dollars and be done with it. When this is happening, I'm just like, is this real life? Like, is this really happening? Is he just like gonna give them a hundred thousand dollars? What the fork is going on? And then he just does. And it's just like from cereal boxes. He's just like, yeah, my dad like leaves these all over the house. Bundles of money. Now that like, we know his dad is dead, what he should do is go around the house, cut open every pillow, gather that money and put it in a fund for life for him and his brother. I hope we did that. I hope that's the thing that happened before we moved to Colorado. Anyway, back to this scene. He puts in the duffel bag and he gives it to Aza. She just like keeps it and walks away with it. I don't know how I would feel if that happened to me. I, I think it was super refreshing that like they took the money. Like they just took the money because they needed it and it was all fine. But in that moment, I feel like I'd be a little insulted that Davis wouldn't believe me and had to pay me $100,000 to like appease his suspicions. I don't know, weird move with the girl you like. You're not gonna text me. She's like, yes, I am. Well, I don't believe you. Here's $100,000. Go away! And again, like, that's not to say I didn't really appreciate that conversation that Daisy had with Aza or that Aza had with her mom when her mom was like, you shouldn't take the money. You don't want to feel indebted to him. We're programmed to feel that way. We're programmed to be like when someone offers you money to say, no, oh no, I'll do it myself. I don't want to like, I don't want to feel like I owe you something. Like, I don't want to feel indebted to you. I don't want like your charity. I don't want, you know, it, it never happens that they just, they take it that, that the person who's taking the money in anything ever is like a decent human being. You know what I'm saying? Like if someone takes the money in any media that I've ever seen, it's always portrayed to be like, oh, they're out for themselves and nobody else. They're just here, they're scamming them. Like they're a con artist. It, it was so different and interesting and nice to see it handled so chill. Is that a word? So chilly. I'm still like super worried about Noah. Side tangent. I just, this 13 year old boy is smoking pot and drinking and partying. Do they not have any, any relatives at all? Or cousins or like somebody to call? Oh, it hurt my heart every time we saw him and he was so upset. Let's talk about their dad for a second. Were you expecting him to be dead? I, I just wasn't. And it turned out like, you know, that the mystery was kind of just background plot for the relationships between these different characters. But I was expecting there to be like some sort of twist. This is what happens with John Green mysteries, I guess for me. I work it out to be much more than it is. I'm expecting it to be like some Dan Brown shit or like twist, twist, running, jumping, they're after you, codes and clues. But like it ends up being more about the characters' personal journeys and stuff. And the dad was just dead and not just dead. Like we didn't even get to see like really how he died. The thing happened with Paper Towns was like, oh my God, what happened to Margot? Where's Margot gonna be? Oh my, and she was just like chilling in another town. Like, back to Davis's blog. One of his poems that I really liked was the one he wrote two weeks after his father's disappearance. He carried me around my whole life, picked me up, took me here and there, said, come with me, I'll take you, we'll have fun. We never did. You never know a father's weight until it's lifted. I think that was some of Davis's best work. And in the same scene, I have like a whole other section highlighted because like a second after she rereads that poem, Davis texts her and he's like, are you on my blog right now? And I'm like, how do you know? Where are you? How can you see me? Freaking out 
for her. And Aza's just like, maybe is that okay? Like, she's just like so fearless when it comes to honesty. Just speaking her mind. And it's something that, again, both of them do. They'll just be like, what are you thinking? And she'll be like, exactly what she's thinking. It's hard to do that. For me, at least, like, I'd really have to trust that person. And even then, sometimes, like, I'm not gonna tell them exactly what I'm thinking. No, those thoughts, those are mine. This is, this is for me. And he's like, I'm just glad it's you. My analytics said someone from Indianapolis has been on the site for 30 minutes. How you can know that? And Davis is like not self-conscious about it. Again, Davis is writing about his innermost thoughts of life. And like this girl he likes is reading it and like there's thoughts about her in it. And it's just like, this is so embarrassing, but nobody here finds it embarrassing. They're so candor. If that was me, I'd be mortified. I love when they start FaceTime this passage about FaceTiming. I'm lit by only the light in his room and he's lit by mine and like this like super in-depth thoughtful paragraph about FaceTiming in the dark with someone you like was just so John Green. I mean like obviously the whole book is so John Green. It was on page 198 when she said looking for anything that might connect a jogger's mouth or a jogger's mouth I was like oh it's the mouth of a river because we spent so much time talking about that river in the beginning. There's a mouth on a river and it took them the whole rest of the book to figure it out. It's like, guys, river mouth, mouth river, check that out. Nobody did. No one listens to me when I talk to text. But another thing that really, really hurt my heart was when Daisy and Asa were kind of fighting and she said that Michael once said that you're like mustard, great in small qualities, but then a lot of you is a lot. That hearts. The last thing I have here that I highlighted that really hit home for me in particular is when she was thinking about how she's gonna function by herself. She thinks about going to college and she's like, if I can't even function here, how am I gonna function all alone in another state in college? Like, how am I ever gonna be an adult? I can never be a, become a functioning grown-up like this. It was inconceivable that I'd ever have a career. In job interviews, they'd ask me, what's your greatest weakness? And I've explained that I'll probably spend a good portion of the workday terrorized with thoughts I'm forced to think, possessed by a nameless and formless demon. So if that's gonna be an issue, you might not wanna hire me. I've had those same thoughts about like, if I like fate listening to someone talk about, you know, I don't even wanna talk about it because I don't wanna get worked out. But like, if I faint when someone's just talking about this, or like, would I go to the doctor? Like, how am I gonna be alone? How am I gonna live by myself? How am I gonna do anything alone? Like, I had those thoughts when I was going off to college. I had those thoughts when I moved from New Jersey to California. Like, ugh, you can't let those thoughts stop you from living. Just like, future Aza says, you're gonna get through this. There are always gonna be ups and downs and you're not always gonna be down. You can't let the fear of being in one of those down places stop you from ever doing things. In general, Turtles All the Way Down had me feeling very reflective a lot. I've never had a word for like what goes on when I get caught up in these feelings and these thoughts. And it wasn't until like John said a thought spiral. He like mentioned it in a video and I like latched onto that because it was exactly what happened. Like it, it was the perfect metaphor. I have trouble talking about these things. Like talking about them spins me into the spirals. <laughs> I'm having so much trouble trying to share like my personal thoughts along with it. what's going on with Asa and I'm sorry. <sighs> I have this like overwhelming desire to master my own mental health because I have this overwhelming aversion and anxiety when it comes to like seeing any doctor. I thought that I was fine with like the eye doctor, but last month she put the stupid drops in my eyes and I started freaking out and I couldn't stop thinking about like, I, I, I don't even want to talk about what I was thinking, but I, it was so embarrassing. I hate it. I, I ended up like curled up on the floor, just being like, I need a minute, I just need a minute. I, I, could, I could do this, I could stop it. I knew I could stop it, but I knew it was gonna take me like a good 10 minutes to like breathe through it on the floor with my head between my knees. Well, why was I talking about this? This book talk is like 50% Christine discusses the book, 50% Christine tries to share how it personally relates to her life, but just ends up babbling about nothing and sweating profusely. I too have anxiety. I too have thought spirals. And I'm sure a lot of you do too. And I'm sure a lot of you really found this to be an emotional, relatable book. And I think it's written beautifully. And I love to hear anything that you'd like to share any thoughts on the book. Let's talk about it in the comments. My name's Christine. I make videos every Tuesday. If you want to follow me on Twitter or Instagram, I'm at xteenmay. Thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time. Goodbye!